and uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Supratim Ghosh. I am an associate professor at uh, the University of Saskatchewan, Canada, as well as a member of the AOCS Edible Application Technology Division. The Edible Applica Application Technology Division supports technical programming at the AOCS annual meeting, several hours for students and researchers, and the many other division activities, such as today's webinar for its nearly 200 members. In today's webinar, Professor Kuhn Dewaiting from Ghent University of Belgium will present the science behind the quality and taste of Belgian chocolate with his co-presenter, Claudia Del Baer. They will explain what makes Belgium chocolate unique and how its excellent quality is assured through selection of high quality ingredients and the use of specific equipment in the manufacturing process. They will also present the latest results from cocoa and chocolate research at Kent University, covering the whole chain from farmer to praline. They will focus on sustaining high quality cocoa production, post harvest processing, genetic diversity, bioactive compounds, chocolate formulation and reformulation, innovative chocolate processing, and fat and sugar bloom. Professor Kuhn Dewaiting is a full professor since 1999 and the head of the Laboratory of Food Technology and Engineering of Ghent University in Belgium. He leads a research group of about 30 people that focuses on food design on a microscopic scale. The main product groups of interest are dairy products, margarine and shortening, chocolate and confectionery products. Kun Tewalting is currently the chair of the International Food Structure and Functionality Forum and CEO of the company Cacao Lab, a spin-off of Ghent University, and an infrastructure, which is an infrastructure fully dedicated to cocoa and chocolate research. Claudia Delbar worked as a scientist, scientific researcher in the lab of Professor Dewey Tink for five years. She worked on several research projects focusing on solutions for migration-induced fat bloom in complex chocolate products for the chocolate industry. Since 2013, she has been working as a project manager at the company Cacao Lab. Now, uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, I request that you please type them into the chat box on the right side of the screen. We will have time for question and answer after the presentation. In order to keep the background noise down, we will keep all the participants' audio muted. Now, with that, I would like to say thank you, Kuhn and Claudia, for presenting this webinar and sharing your knowledge about the science of Belgian chocolates with us. I will now turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Supratim. Thank you very much. Um, we would like to get started with a movie um, on tempering of chocolate, because tempering is a very crucial step in obtaining a high quality chocolate. And um, we would like to show in a movie what is the importance of tempering. So um, I will uh, start the movie now, um, and I will get some comments what what we are doing in the lab. So the movie was made in in, in Cacao Lab, um, and then we will move to the to the presentation. And later on, when we talk about tempering, um, we will show a second movie to show what is the effect of tempering. So I'm starting the movie now. And um, the first thing you can see is that our chocolatier um, is uh, filling a plastic mold with melted chocolate. So you can see the temperature of the chocolate is higher than 45 degrees C, meaning that we have no fat crystals in this chocolate. So the chocolate that is molded right now is not uh, tempered. So she, she filled the mold, then she scraped off the excess of chocolate, now she is vibrating a little bit to remove the air bubbles. And then after this, um, yeah, it takes a while. After this, 
she has put the chocolates in the cooling. Then later on, we made the second chocolate, um, which was tempered. You can see on the right uh, side that the temperature is, low, is lower. So this chocolate is tempered, and we tested it before, before that it's well tempered. Um, so she did the same. She filled the mold, removed the excess of chocolate, and also vibrated the chocolate a little bit. Yes. And after that, she has put the mold into the cooling as well. A little bit more vibration. <laughs> Tempered chocolate is a little bit more viscous, so it takes a bit more time to remove air bubbles. Uh, that is the reason why it takes a bit more time. Now, she puts the mold in the cooling as well. So uh, the cooling is at, is at 11 degrees C. And we uh, have stored then the chocolate for one hour at the cooling cabinet. And in a second movie, later on during the presentation, we will see the difference between these two chocolates. So now I am going to the PowerPoint presentation. And I will give the floor to uh, Professor Kundur, I think. Hello, everybody. First of all, thank you very much, dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor Supertin Gosh for the very kind introduction, and also my sincere thanks to uh, American Oil Chem Society for inviting us uh, to give this seminar. So today, as uh, told already before, we will talk about the, the scientific aspects behind the quality and taste of Belgium chocolate and Belgium chocolates. We will see during the presentation that they actually have a different meaning. Um, so, Cacao Lab uh, is actually a spin-off company of Ghent University and fully dedicated to consultancy and contract work for third parties, uh, let's say uh, ingredient producers, chocolate producers all over the globe. And our slogan is innovation and training from uh, bean to praline, uh, which sounds very nice if I may say so. But what is Belgian chocolate? Um, during this lecture, we will focus on Belgium chocolate from different viewpoints. And the first important thing that we can mention is that it is true, Belgium chocolate is really based on tradition. And that is one of the reasons why we produce high quality products in Belgium that are known all over the world. But still, we need to be humble. Because uh, as far as I can see in Belgium, which is a very small country uh, located in the center of Europe, there is not any cocoa tree growing in Belgium. We just do not have the climatological conditions to make that happen. And even if climate is changing, that won't happen in the near or uh, even distant future. No cocoa producing countries highlighted in this scheme are located around the equator. Originally, cocoa tree uh, was growing in the Amazon forest somewhere in Latin America, but today, especially West Africa produces a huge, vast amount of cocoa beans. Actually, West African countries are producing 65 to 70 percent of the world cocoa bean production. But coming back to Latin America, the cocoa tree, the production of cocoa beans, is very old. Um, the first traces of theobromine, which is a very important uh, component in, um, in cocoa and chocolate, well, uh, the first traces were actually identified from pottery over 44,000 years old. So there is a very uh, old history of cocoa. And let's face it, Belgium is even a very young country. It's only 180, year, uh, 180 years young we can say. So can we really talk about uh, a, a tradition in Belgium? Well, I think so, but we have to stay humble and look um, from this viewpoint as well. So what is Belgium chocolate? So let me start by mentioning some important highlights in the Belgium chocolate industry. Well, first of all, uh, already in the 1700s, before Belgium was actually existing, but in this area, the first chocolateries were opened uh, in, this, uh, in this region. 
And it took a while until 1890, where European countries and Belgium, uh, uh, which was existing then already, um, was a very important player in, uh, in the legal protection of what is true chocolate, based on the ingredients and the formulation. And then we make a jump to 1906, where uh, Leo Bacaland, which is an alumnus from Ghent University, so we're very proud of that, invents actually the first plastic material, which is bakelite, uh, bakelite sorry, which was used not only for making telephones, um, but also for making chocolate malls. So that is also a very interesting link with Belgium. And then in 1906, uh, we also have the uh, family Calabot, who establishes a factory in Wiese. Uh, now the company is called Barry Calabot, but that factory is still there. Uh, it is located somewhat 30 kilometers from here, um, and it is still today the largest chocolate producing factory in the world. So it is a huge factory located actually in a small village. If you can ever visit it, please do so. It is a very impressive factory. And the moment you're approaching the factory, you will smell cocoa in the air because of roasting and conching activities. And then in 1912, something interesting to mention, everybody knows now, Neuhaus. Um, well, actually, Jean Neuhaus launches the Belgian Perline. Belgian Perline, which is a filled chocolate concept. And some years later, his wife invented the balotin. You can see the box at the right. The balotin, which is a kind of uh, cardboard box, a very traditional box, but still used today to uh, present uh, pralines and sell them all over the globe. So Belgian chocolate, to continue, first of all, it is good to mention, it is a protected uh, name, so Belgium chocolate should be made in Belgium. It's not such a long time ago that it was really decided, um, uh, let's say, the regulations with respect to mentioning Belgium chocolate on the, on the package, but uh, actually you can summarize it in the sense that it should be made in Belgium. So we have a lot of companies, big companies, producing chocolate in Belgium, Belgium chocolate it can be called. So what about the cocoa and chocolate business in Belgium? Well, first of all, we have to mention that grinding, that is the turning of cocoa nips into cocoa liquor, is not our most important activity. The most important grinders are located in our neighboring country in France. This is the Netherlands. There you have a lot of grinding activities around the harvest. And um, so also the Belgian chocolate companies, they do not only buy cocoa, buy cocoa beans, but they also buy cocoa mass, cocoa butter, cocoa powder, so intermediate products. So these products are very often acquired elsewhere and turned into chocolate. It can be mentioned as well that the port of Antwerp uh, is in the European Union, the second largest important port for storage and throughput of cocoa beans. But there are other important ports in uh, Europe as well, like Hamburg, for instance. What is interesting to mention as well is that the production of industrial chocolate, we call it chocolate couverture, eh? uh, B2B chocolate, if you want, is very relevant in Belgium. We have Four major chocolate producing companies active, uh, which is uh, Barry Calabot, Cargill, Puratus Belcolade, and Mondelez International. Not to forget, those companies, international companies, produce 20% of the industrial chocolate in the world in Belgium. So uh, this also illustrates that these chocolate activities of them are important in the sense that the chocolate they make and produce in Belgium can afterwards be called Belgium chocolate and labeled as such. Furthermore, Belgium chocolate has everything to do uh, with high quality ingredients. Um, you cannot make a high quality chocolate without high quality cocoa and other ingredients. It is just as simple as that. 
In the next slide, you see uh, some examples of chocolate formulations, so dark chocolate, milk chocolate, white chocolate. Today, there is also the pink chocolate, the ruby chocolate. And, but those three are still the most important chocolates that are existing. And in every one of these, we use cocoa ingredients. And there are some differences. In dark chocolate, we use cocoa butter combined with cocoa liquor, which is the same as cocoa mouth. Not to forget, the cocoa liquor also has a significant fraction of cocoa butter. So cocoa butter, cocoa liquor, and a vast amount of sugar, almost 50%. But let me stress, there are dark chocolates available with larger cocoa contents and therefore less sugar as well. In dark chocolate, you will not find milk ingredients, except depending on the region in the world. And um, uh, for instance, in Europe, you might also add a little bit of milk fat. There is also soy lecithin involved as an emulsifier, well, it is actually important to control the flow behavior of the dark chocolate in a liquid form. In milk chocolate, you have cocoa butter, cocoa liquor, but besides sugar, also milk powder, dried milk uh, involved, and soy lecithin. And white chocolate, some people say white chocolate is not true chocolate. Well, it is just not true. White chocolate is chocolate because it contains cocoa butter, but no cocoa mass, not the, ground, uh, the brown stuff. Besides that, also a lot of sugar and milk powder and soy lecithin. So high quality cocoa ingredients play a very important role in the production of high quality chocolate. So let us go back to, uh, to where it all starts from. Those um, are major ripe pots, pots, which are cocoa fruits growing on cocoa trees around the equator. Those pots are harvested. You have two main harvesting periods uh, every year. Uh, here you see a picture of cocoa pot harvesting in West Africa. Afterwards, the pots are opened. Inside the pots, you have the white, tasty fruit flesh and cocoa beans. A botanist would say those are not beans, but seeds, and it is actually true, but we call them cocoa beans. And those cocoa beans are actually fermented. Here you see a picture where the beans are being fermented in a heap below banana leaves, but you also have box fermentation, uh, which is used also in many countries. During that fermentation, important phenomena take place where the precursor molecules are being formed that will determine the final chocolate flavor. In the fermentation, you first have a yeast, uh, activity followed by uh, lactic acid and acetic acid bacteria uh, because later in the fermentation process oxygen is introduced by turning the beans. After the fermentation which might take about five to six days the drying is happening which is conventionally being done with sun. Sun drying of the fermented beans. This sounds easy but it is truly not always easy to do it like that because in a lot of tropical, subtropical countries, heavy rains can occur, and then it is just not easy uh, quite often to cover the beans as soon as possible to prevent them from getting moist uh, again. So drying the beans is, is important also because you have to prevent the growth of molds. Molds can cause a moldy flavor, which is very unwanted, but equally important, even more important, I would say, they can produce mycotoxins, like okra toxin, so we don't want, obviously, the consumer to get ill from eating chocolate. And then the beans are being back and are transported all over the world. Now, the fermentation, as I mentioned, is very crucial. During the fermentation, that takes about five to six days, a lot of conversions take place. And here you see two pictures. On the left you see, and this picture was only taken a couple of weeks ago when I was visiting uh, some plantations in Uganda, you see violet beans. Looks a very nice color, but this is not what we want. The violet color is caused by certain type of polyphenolic structures in the chocolate, and that means that the uh, organic acids have not reached the internal phase of the beans sufficiently, that means they are under-fermented. 
and not good for high quality chocolate making. What we need is shown on the right. Those are brown beans, which means they are fully fermented. Now what you see here is what we call a bean cut test. It's like a guillotine system where you are cutting simultaneously a certain number of beans and there are ways of uh, checking this and, 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 and actually identifying the degree of fermentation. But you can also do it more um, uh, analytically, let's say, with, um, with, uh, with analytical tools in the lab. And here you see a, a more um, quantitative approach, let's say, where you see the fermentation index for different, um, for different bags of beans and, and uh, the fluctuations that might occur. So fermentation, uh, thorough fermentation is crucial to have a good final chocolate flavor. And actually, in Belgium, they have a very strict quality control with respect to that, and that is one of the reasons why Belgian chocolate is so well known and appreciated. Now, these are pictures that we took with our lab in combination or collaboration with another lab, the Wood Lab of UGAND. And this is a picture, an X-ray CT scan of a cocoa bean. You have a cross-sectional view on the left and a longitudinal view on the right. And what you see, especially on the right, is at the left and the right part, you see two cotyledons. And cotyledons are actually the storage facilities of the beans. They contain a huge amount of energy in the form of fat, but also starch, which is essential for the plants to grow out of a bean when it is germinating in the soil. You actually see in the middle, at the bottom, you see the radical, that is the initial uh, stage uh, of the, where the plant will grow from the bean. Now, the left and the right part, the cotyledons, they form what we later will call the cocoa nips, and they will be grinded into cocoa moss. Um, this is a picture of the cotyledon uh, of, an unfermented, uh, of an unfermented bean. And you see that you have different structures uh, to be identified. You have lipid protein cells. You have polyphenolic cells that are full of antioxidants, which are, uh, as we will see later on, uh, resulting in the powerhouse of antioxidants that is present in cocoa beans. And you also have starch granules. This is uh, showing a cellular structures of uh, for, uh, unfermented beans, where you still can identify the different uh, structures inside the cell. And you see that after fermentation, you see a totally different structure inside the cells of cocoa beans. What's more illustrating the very dramatic changes that are occurring during the fermentation from a microstructural point of view. So how do we process uh, these beans, these fermented dried beans, into primary cocoa ingredients? Well, first of all, the roasting plays a very important role. Now, roasting normally takes place in the countries where the chocolate is being produced. Roasting is a time temperature program that is applied and also very important for the flavor development of the final chocolate. Now here you see um, an illustration showing you the effect of the roasting conditions on the volatile components that were determined in my, in my lab by GCMS. So um, you see that in this case, three different conditions were applied, always 30 minutes roasting, but at three different temperatures. And I will not go too much into detail, but you see that the profile of those volatile components is clearly changing on the roasting conditions. Acetic acid, which is a volatile component that we want to remove during the processing of chocolate, is decreasing once you are applying higher temperatures. And pyrazines are actually increasing, and pyrazines are also very important for the final chocolate flavor. After the roasting, the beans are being breaked up and winnowed. Winnowing means that we are removing the shell of the cocoa beans, and that results into the fractions, the different parts of the two cotyledons, and those we call cocoa nips. So the picture actually is showing uh, roasted cocoa nips 
It is also possible to remove the shell and then roast the nips afterwards. So that is another methodology, but this is the most conventional one. Those nips uh, are then grinded, uh, for instance, with a beet mill grinder, the picture you see there, into cocoa liquor, where the particle size is very important. For instance, the particle size of 40 micrometer is quite often aimed at. That cocoa liquor is then something that we can further process by pressing. Pressing of cocoa liquor will result in cocoa cake, which can be grinded into cocoa powder, and which is a very important ingredient in many, many food products. But on the other hand, you then have pure cocoa butter. And in high quality chocolate making, besides cocoa liquor, there is always extra cocoa butter added to have the ideal melting uh, profile and flavor release when you are eating the chocolate. So, as I mentioned, cake can be milled into cocoa powder. Now, very often they produce cocoa butter and cocoa powder from beans that are not fermented. That is happening quite often uh, because fermentation is an extra step. And in the production of cocoa powder and cocoa butter, uh, it is not strictly essential to ferment the beans, but it will have an effect on the flavor as well. So what about cocoa butter? In the European Union, you have, of course, a, a legislation, we call it the EU Directive, and this mentioned the fats that are allowed in a chocolate formulation. Obviously, cocoa butter, but also milk fat can be used. But then, besides those lipids, you can also add maximum, on final product base, 5% of vegetable fats that are different from cocoa butter. We call these cocoa butter equivalents, or CBEs. It is also strictly regulated which raw materials can be used and which processes can be used to make CBEs. First of all, they can only be made by refining and or fractionation, quite often both, but, for instance, not enzymatic interesterification. The raw materials that you can use are palm oil, but I can mention you need four to five fractionations before you get uh, a good CBE, elipid butter, saw fat, sheep butter, cocoon butter, and or mango kernel fat. Quite often commercial CBEs are a mixture of these. If you add more than 5% of those other fats, for instance, by using palm kernel oil or coconut oil, um, you are not having a product which can be called chocolate. This is called a compound chocolate or a compound coating because quite often these used, are, uh, these used products um, are uh, used for, co for coating other food products. And it is also allowed to add a certain fraction of coconut oil in chocolate for ice cream formulations, and this is primarily being done to prevent the cracking of the chocolate uh, uh, after freezing. Now, Belgian chocolate, and this is important to mention, uh, most, uh, if not all, Belgium companies, they say for Belgium chocolate, we only use 100% cocoa butter. And this is now the rule, let's say. So one of the quality criteria is that for Belgium chocolate, we only use cocoa butter and no CBEs. Now, the typical melting behavior is one of the reasons why uh, a lot of people uh, are really liking chocolate so much, so much. So the melting behavior is a very important amount for good chocolate. And that's why cocoa butter is so particular. Now, cocoa butter especially consists of three main triglycerides, POP, POS, and SOS. P standing for palmitic acid, O for oleic acid, and S for stearic acid. And the oleic acid is always located in the middle position. And that creates typical crystallization and melting behavior to summarize a very sharp melting. Very important. First of all, you need enough solid fat at 20 degrees. This is important for the handling properties, but also to have a good snap. It even makes a noise upon fracture uh, in the mouth. Afterwards, also between 20 and 25, there still needs to be enough solid fat to prevent stickiness at the moment of consumption. So chocolate should not melt too quickly in the hands, but should melt in the mouth. A sharp melting profile between 25 and 30 degrees 
is very essential for the flavor release and also for the cold sensation because when cocoa butter is melting, heat is, uh, is necessary, uh, heat from the mouth to melt the uh, fat crystals. And then everything should be melted at body temperature to prevent a waxy mouthfeel. Um, Belgium chocolate is also a lot about know-how. So what is the know-how? How do we make chocolate? Because there are many different approaches to that. Now, a first step in chocolate making is a thorough mixing. So here you see the ingredients, sugar, cocoa liquor, also called cocoa mask, cocoa butter, milk powder, everything is mixed together. Here you see a couple of pictures uh, that are showing the mixing uh, equipment that we have available in the cacao lab here in Everham, close to Ghent. After the mixing, the particles are still rather coarse. So if you want to have a smooth chocolate, the maximum particle diameter should be below 30 micrometers to avoid that sandy mouthfeel. And here you also have differences. Um, uh, uh, not only the, 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 the raw refining is, is, is a very complex uh, process where we use five roll refiners in Belgium to create a very good particle size distribution and but it differs in Europe and Belgium in particular from other places in the world for instance in continental European chocolate we have a somewhat smaller particle size average particle size compared to North American chocolate, for instance, which is a bit coarser. And this is also one of the reasons why the sensory uh, perception is different. At the right, you see a picture of a three-row refiner that we are using in our lab. You see that we start from a, a kind of dough-like system, a very viscous dough-like system, but during the grinding, the particles uh, are uh, decreased in size. You have a much higher specific surface area that binds a lot of fat. So in the end, what comes out is a very dry product. The next slide shows you particle size distributions of sugar, skin milk powder, cocoa mass, and the end products, dark chocolate and milk chocolate. Uh, you see immediately that sugar and skim milk powder are consisting of rather coarse particles. The end products have a particle size that is much smaller, but it is important that not only the large particles are removed, but also you are not having too many smaller particles. If the tail towards the smaller particles is too pronounced, you will have also uh, a dry mouthfeel of the chocolate, which is not wanted. So controlling particle size is essential to make a high quality chocolate. That brings us to the next step where you have the conching taking place. During the conching at particular stages, we add extra cocoa butter, but also uh, an emulsifier, which is quite often soy lecithin, to make the final chocolate, the liquid chocolate that needs to be crystallized afterwards. The crunching is a very intensive mixing and shearing process at elevated temperature. The heating is being performed by the equipment itself, but also because of the shearing activities that take place in the conch. Now, a crunching stage can be, let's say, separated in different substages. So after feeding the conch, the first thing that takes place is the dry conching because you are adding that dry looking material that was produced by the raw refining. Because of heating and shearing, you are turning it into a paste. That's what we call the pasty phase. During that heating and shearing, the moisture content is reduced, which is very important for the final properties of also the liquid chocolate. Because if chocolate contains too much moisture, you will not have the, uh, the wanted rheological properties. Besides that, we will also evaporate certain volatiles, which is important for the final flavor development. Here you have a vast amount of acetic acid that was formed during the fermentation removed as well. 
And also very important is that you try to make the fat in the system become more available. You want to increase the free fat content. And that is very important because as um, the more fat you can liberate during the conching, the less cocoa butter you will need to add afterwards. Uh, and so to have the certain desired rheological properties. So making the fat functional uh, from that perspective is very important, as is illustrated also in the figure of Beckett. After the pasty phase, we will add that extra cocoa butter, as well as soy lecithin, let's say it as it is. Adding lecithin is also essential if you want to reduce the necessary amount of cocoa butter that needs to be added. You can easily make a chocolate without lecithin, but you will have to use more cocoa butter to have the good rheological properties, and therefore the product is more costly. But adding those products and mixing them thoroughly will actually liquefy uh, the chocolate and uh, create a certain flow behavior. Afterwards, it can be discharged. So what we now have is the final chocolate composition, but the chocolate is still liquid. So the next step is turning the liquid chocolate into solid chocolate, which is called tempering or a kind of pre-crystallization process. Cocoa butter is an essential fat, as I mentioned, uh, because of its typical uh, triglyceride composition. It has typical crystallization and melting properties, but it is a very difficult fat. Why? Because cocoa butter can exist in many different kinds of polymorphs. Now, polymorphs have exactly the same chemical composition, but a different crystalline structure. And that makes it very complex, but also very challenging. To illustrate, the beta-5 is the polymorph that we desire in the final chocolate product. It has the required contraction properties, gloss properties and snap properties, so the desired texture. That is the polymorph we want to have in the final solid chocolate. The problem is that thermodynamically, you cannot directly turn the liquid cocoa butter into this polymorph. Well, it might happen, but it will take hundreds of years, and that is really not something we want to uh, apply in the industry. It would just take too long because of the high activation energy uh, that is needed uh, for this uh, polymorph uh, to be formed directly from the melt. So we need to have a kind of other approach. So what we are doing is we are cooling the chocolate to lower temperatures and create more unstable polymorphs. We talk about gamma polymorphs, alpha polymorphs, and beta prime polymorphs. And those can be turned into that stable beta-5 polymorph. So we need to have a kind of other longer uh, route to create those beta-5 polymorphs. So what is happening during tempering is that we are cooling the chocolate, creating a mixture of stable beta-5 and unstable polymorphs, and then adding once more some liquid higher temperature chocolate to melt out the unstable polymorph, leaving only the stable polymorph. And when you have a concentration of stable beta-5, which is high enough, you can further let the chocolate crystallize and cool down. To end this story, beta-5 is thermodynamically, unfortunately, not the most stable polymorph. It is the beta-6. So why not making chocolate with beta-6 the problem is actually that beta-6 has a too high melting temperature to have a really good sensory perception of the, the chocolate and its melting properties. So we need the beta-5, but not the beta-6. And that is also the reason why chocolate would always bloom after some time, because thermodynamically in the end, beta-6 will always be formed. So now there is another movie that Claudia will show about the temper chocolate. Yes. Just a moment. I will start the movie right now. So we have put the chocolates for one hour in the fridge, and then we take them out again. The first one is the mold with the untempered chocolate. The second mold is the one with the tempered chocolate. So also here on the left side and the right side, you can see a clear difference 
in uh, contraction behavior. So the tempered chocolate uh, clearly detached from the mold, and the untempered one, which uh, was taken now, does not even uh, detach at all. So we cannot demold the chocolate, but the tempered chocolates are demolded very nicely. So uh, that is one of the important reasons why uh, chocolate should be tempered. Okay, then we will go back to our um, presentation. Okay. Okay, so let's continue. Belgium chocolate and Belgium chocolates. Um, well, actually, we use another term. Uh, we call most of the time Belgium chocolates here the typical pralines. Pralines as I mentioned, being invented in Belgium by Jean Neuhaus. Um, but today, not only Neuhaus, but also Godiva, Leonidas, Gilliam, and many other uh, small and medium-sized enterprises and chocolatiers are making pralines a very important Belgian food commodity. Um, so the production of chocolates or pralines can be done in different ways. So you have the traditional molding, but you also have the enrobing, cold stamping, and one-shot technology. Belgium is also about innovation, and that's why we founded the Cacao Lab as a spin-off company of Ghent University, because, well, science is progressing, and we want to apply the fundamental science into practice and create new formulations, new processing methodologies, and combinations. So at Ghent University, a lot of fundamental research is taking place, but this research is actually covering, well, let's say, uh, almost the whole chain, uh, starting from our research that we are doing in cocoa-producing uh, countries, where we try to sustain high-quality cocoa production over post-harvesting, uh, like post-harvest cocoa processing, like fermentation and drying. We also focus on genetic diversity and bioactive compounds. We also have research on going on fat crystallization and reformulation of the chocolate products. We also focus on innovative chocolate processing, especially on a smaller scale, because today uh, chocolate is being more and more produced bean to bar by chocolatiers. Uh, we also focus, obviously, on microstructure, flow behavior, and sensory properties, on chocolates with an ethnic culinary tradition, as we will show with uh, the palm sap sugar chocolate, but also on fat and sugar bloom, which are actually stability issues that might occur when you're making pralines for export. This picture is a picture taken some years ago during our five-year uh, project in Ghana, where I visited uh, several cocoa villages, and this was one in the eastern region, you see that these cocoa farmers, especially female farmers, uh, were actually uh, drying their fermented beans. Uh, and I came with a box of chocolate made from Ghanaian beans. And I can tell you, these uh, farmers never tasted chocolate themselves. So uh, that's why they were so happy that I could get them Ghanaian chocolate made from their own beans. Something to think about. So one of my Ghanaian PhD students, John Eden Conger, was involved in this five-year project in Ghana where we surveyed and worked together with over 600 farms in six different cocoa-producing regions. And the first important result is that the cocoa productivity all over Ghana, which is the second largest cocoa producer in the world, yeah, as a whole, but at farm level, the cocoa productivity is very low. To illustrate, um, here you see uh, what we uh, obtained as a result. Here you see on the, the y-axis the cocoa productivity in kilograms per hectare as a function of the cumulative frequency, and uh, productivity of 100 kilograms, one ton per hectare, is something that should be easily obtained when the farmers are having sufficient fertilizer and sufficient support. But only less than 1% of the farmers have a productivity of 1,000 kilograms per hectare. 
Even more, what is mentioned by FAO stat, which is the national average of 500 kilograms per hectare, is contrasting what we obtained from our survey, where the productivity was only 235 kilograms per hectare. That's even less than 50% of the national average, which was communicated by FAO stat. And finally, one bag of beans contains 64 kilograms, and one on five farmers have a productivity that is even less than one bag per hectare. That illustrates clearly that the productivity is far too low and that farmers can just not survive by growing cocoa alone. Another uh, PhD student from Ghana, Michael Hine, he was studying uh, the effect of storing the pots on the final chocolate quality. As I mentioned, pots can be stored. Afterwards, you remove the internal phase, which is uh, obviously the beans and some of the fruit flesh. Uh, and after the fermentation, you have the drying. Well, first of all, pot storage is quite often applied. So almost 90% of the farmers are storing their pots before they open them. And this just because of practical reasons, because they do not have enough people to help them to open the pots um, on a, in, a, in a short time frame. So let's say about 50% store the pots one to three days, 50% uh, four to seven days, and only a minor percentage longer than seven days. But we investigated the effect on precursor molecules. Here you see that both the total reducing sugar content as well as free amino acids increase uh, when you are comparing zero, three, and seven days of pot storage. And that will have an effect on the sensory profiles. Uh, pots that were stored uh, for zero days, that means after harvest, immediately opened and fermented, they clearly have some floral attributes. When you have pots that were stored three days, you have a diminishing of the fruity and earthy attributes, and finally, seven days create a higher acidity. So, depending on the pot storage, you clearly have different sensory profiles, which is an opportunity to create more diversity into origin denying cocoa. Talking about origin and varieties, here this slide shows you the four major types of cocoa beans. Forastero, Criollo, Trinitario, and Nacional. Now, Forastero is grown, well, let's say, West Africa and Ghana in particular, they practically only grow Forastero. Criollo is typical uh, a bean that is uh, being grown in Latin America. The problem is that it's very high susceptible to diseases and not having a high yield. The beans are also not brown, by the way. They are more white yellowish. Trinitario is a hybrid of Forastero and Criollo, trying to combine the advantages of both types of beans and being grown uh, also worldwide. And then finally, Nacional is creating fine flavor cocoa, also called Arriba cocoa, typical for Ecuador. So there are different varieties based on the phenotype, but the phenotype obviously is based on the genetic information of the genotype. And the genotype will determine the flavor potential. Parentage analysis can be performed. Identification and mislabeling can also be performed because in a lot of countries they are growing beans and they are actually not knowing which kind of beans the farmers are growing. So we are working together with the UGEN Cocoa Genotyping Team uh, as well. Um, so the UGEN uh, Cocoa Genotyping Team, of which my wife is the director, is uh, doing research all over the globe, for instance in Vietnam, uh, here you see a picture of Helena uh, harvesting pots. We are also working in Ecuador on the fine flavor cocoa in South America, and we also did work in Congo and in Ghana. Here you see a picture of Jocelyn uh, opening some pots here. So working together with cocoa producing countries and having a view on the genetic diversity is also one of our key areas where we collaborate with this cocoa genotyping team. This picture is showing you a very old cocoa tree in Yangambi. Yangambi is a region in Congo, and you might know, it's not something always to be proud of, but the Belgians were in the Congo 
uh, it was a very important colony uh, a long time ago, but still, and those trees were planted in those days. The thing is, those trees are there, they have still some pots, but the people, the local people are not knowing what kind of cocoa they are dealing with. So we were also identifying the genotypes being grown there in Congo. And we tried to, uh, let's say, intensify cocoa production because it can result in, uh, in better living conditions for the farmer as a cash crop. So here you see, based on, um, on a, a multivariate analysis, the clustering of all the different types of uh, cocoa beans and uh, trying to summarize the conclusion uh, with respect to our research in Congo is that the Congo beans are clearly differentiated from the other more conventional type of beans that are being uh, harvested on the world. So this opens an interesting opportunity. Now, uh, research on cocoa bioactive compounds is also very important because uh, cocoa is a real powerhouse of many different types of antioxidants shown on the left of this figure. One that is very interesting are the flavanols. By the way, Barry Calabos uh, has patented a process to increase the concentration of flavanols, and this resulted in a product, Acticoa, which is actually lowering uh, the uh, blood pressure uh, because of the vasodilatation effect. Um, but there are more effects than that. Here you see on the, on the right all kinds of reported positive uh, health effects of the flavanols. Um, there are a lot of antioxidants in uh, chocolate, but uh, uh, Dimas from Indonesia investigated what can happen if you enrich chocolate with a flavoring agent like cinnamon. Not to forget to mention is that a lot of chocolate in Europe and Belgium is flavored with vanilla. But in Indonesia, they're very fond of cinnamon. And uh, Dimas actually encapsulated cinnamon into nanoparticles and introduced them in chocolate. And then we analyzed the antioxidative properties and we discovered a true synergistic effect between the antioxidants of cocoa and cinnamon. So they are actually enforcing the antioxidant activity of each other. This picture is the picture of the microstructure of chocolate. We took it several years ago by means of our cryo-scanning electron microscope, and my good friend and colleague Kiyo Sato even used it for his book in Japanese. I'm very uh, happy that he did that. Uh, so we were one of the first to take a nice picture uh, of, uh, of uh, the microstructure of chocolate with that methodology. So you see the fat crystals, the larger sugar crystals, and here and there some spherical cocoa particles. Um, the chocolate composition is here mentioned again, and, and I do this because I want to stress that it is, of course, depending on the formulation, that in chocolate there is a lot of sugar present. It can be going up to 45-50% even. Now, the, cho the sugar sorry, is not only contributing to the sweetness, but it is also contributing to the bulk, the bulkiness, and the textural characteristics. So replacing sugar by intensive sweetness, like stevia, you just cannot do it like that because you cannot replace sugar one-on-one -on -one with, for instance, uh, uh, stevia or aspartame or whatever. You can replace it one-on-one -on -one with certain sugar alcohols, like maltitol, but not with intensive sweetness. But I don't want to talk anymore about the intensive sweetness, but the replacing of, let's say, uh, conventional refined sucrose, where you see a nice picture here of the sucrose crystals, by palm sugar. Now, palm sugar is derived from many palm trees, and it is the most important sweetening agent in Indonesia. And Indonesia is having a very large population, by the way. But replacing sugar by palm sap sugar is just not something you do just like that. And because, first of all, the, uh, the morphology of the sugar crystals is totally different, but also the chocolate microstructural morphology is affected by replacing sucrose with palm sugar. It is especially being noticed um, in the bottom three figures that if you replace 
Sugar, sucrose by pulse up sugar that more agglomerates are introduced into the chocolate microstructure, and this is badly affecting the chocolate rheology. So we, uh, uh, let's say, study different ways of reducing particle agglomeration, and for instance, applying a lower pressure during conching was one of the ways that reduces this agglomeration and resulted in a very nice flow behavior of the palm sap sugar enriched chocolate. I tasted the chocolate, by the way, it is very tasty. It is, it is different, but it is really something very pleasant to eat. Then we're coming near the end of the presentation. We also focus on more innovative, integrated ways of processing chocolate, especially on a smaller scale. So this is one example from my uh, PhD student, uh, Saputra. Um, he combined sugar, cocoa liquor, and cocoa butter into a mixing. Uh, we use the Stefan mixer, uh, for instance, where you have a kind of dry conching taking place to have that conching effect. And we combine this after adding cocoa butter and lecithin in with a beet mill refining. So this is a different approach compared to the conventional approach. But a beet mill a refiner and a Stefan mixer allows you, in their combination, uh, to make liquid chocolate that can be further tempered. So it is a different approach and results in an end product that is very nice with respect to the quality attributes. Obviously, also here, we need to add some extra cocoa butter and lecithin before the liquefaction can take place. Um, in another research, we had another approach where cocoa liquor and sugar were actually combined in a raw refiner or stone grinder, which is a very conventional equipment, even not very expensive. You have it at different scales. It's been used in the U.S. too by a lot of bean-to-bar manufacturers, where you are combining it uh, together. Uh, and this is followed then by, for instance, the conching process in a Stefan mixer where you add cocoa butter and lecithin. So two uh, types of equipment, once more up uh, combined together and resulting in a pretty nice liquid chocolate that can be processed afterwards. Now, Claudia Nobara, who, uh, who is also here sitting next to me, she has a very uh, extensive expertise on to uh, migration-induced fat bloom in filled chocolate, uh, where uh, she studied uh, the, the interaction between the microstructure, the oil migration, and the fat bloom appearance in many products. Now, fat bloom results in a chocolate that is still edible. You can still eat it, but the visual aspect is totally ruined. You see some electronic microscopic pictures of a glossy surface compared to a surface where crystals are present. The light is being uh, let's say, dispersed in many different directions, resulting in a dull gray surface uh, and an, an, an unattractive uh, product. Yeah. Um, the migration-induced fat bloom um, was studied in different ways. Yeah. So the oil migration is very important to accelerate the fat bloom. Oil is actually uh, present in many chocolate fillings. The most well-known filling is actually Ghana, uh, uh, sorry, a praline filling, where you have hazelnut oil. And when the hazelnut oil is migrating through the chocolate shell of a praline, it will uh, uh, essentially accelerate uh, fat bloom uh, formation. So uh, today we are continuously developing strategies to retard fat bloom formation, so the pralines can be exported to countries uh, and still maintain their high quality. For instance, you can apply sub-zero temperatures uh, for that reason. Um, we also studied uh, filled chocolates for the tropics. So I have some nice combinations of pictures obtained by my Vietnamese PhD student Trump. So we start here with the surface, a very glossy surface. Not any crystals are present, but then the oil starts to migrate and you see different small oil droplets on the surface. Fat bloom is not present yet, but we can clearly see that in those oil droplets, the polymorphic transition of beta-5 to beta-6 is accelerated. And here you see a magnification of the crystals after they were growing. And finally, the whole surface is being
being covered with those crystals. They look very nice under the microscope, but as I mentioned, the visual aspect is totally ruined. But also in the tropics, you have high humidity, so sugar bloom can be a problem as well. And I will illustrate that the mechanism is totally different here. Once more, we start here with a, a glossy surface, but then depending on temperature, humidity conditions, you might have condensation of water droplets on the surface. Now, the water droplets on the surface, that is not a big problem, but the problem is that in those droplets, sugar is getting dissolved and recrystallizes again, which will result in the formation of what you can notice here as sugar bloom and eventually also a possible collapse of the praline because it loses its strength. So finally, uh, we are here at the end of the presentation. I hope you liked it. Belgium is also about training. So if you want to learn more about chocolate, chocolate making at the different stages, uh, what is determining uh, the quality more in detail. Uh, well, we are organizing already for several years uh, a workshop and uh, uh, this is a picture of our graduates of the fifth edition of our workshop in 2017. People are all, uh, all looking very happy uh, because they can also taste a lot of chocolate, obviously. But we have a next edition this year uh, in a couple of months, in May, more particularly, between 13 and 24th of May, we are organizing our sixth edition of the workshop. And if you're still uh, interested, there are still a few places left to uh, attend this workshop. So look at our website and the registration is extended for possible interested participants. So here you have take home messages. Belgian chocolate is high quality chocolate made in Belgium. It has to do with a certain finest flavor melting behavior. You have to select high quality ingredients. You have to control your processing conditions carefully. Belgium chocolate is one thing, but the chocolates are pralines is another thing that we are well known of. But creating pralines is unfortunately creating problems that you need to solve if you want to export them over long distances. So thank you very much, and I hope you liked the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks to Kuhn and Claudia for such an entertaining and uh, informative presentation. Uh, we have time for questions. So if you have a question, please type uh, in that uh, box on the right side of your screen or wherever in your screen. And I will uh, read them as I get the questions to, uh, for Kuhn to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question, Kuhn. Uh, yes? Well, can we buy Belgium chocolate in uh, North America or in other parts of the world right now? Yes, you can. Um, a lot of chocolate produced in Belgium is being exported to uh, all kinds of different places in the world. You can find them in the most conventional supermarkets. Actually, I can, I can tell you this because I travel a lot and when I come into a country, I always check the supermarket if Belgium chocolates are available and quite often this is the case in many, many different uh, places, yes. Yes, there is a comment that uh, in many airports you can buy Belgium chocolates as well. Uh, so there is a question. Uh, the question is, do you know how much cocoa is produced in the world each year? In, 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 in number of tons, five million tons per year. Five million tons, wow. Five million tons per year, yes. That's a lot. Okay. And 60 to 70 percent in West Africa. Oh, wow. 60 to 70 percent in West Africa of that amount. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have an, uh, another uh, uh, question on, um, you said that the palm sugar, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what is palm sugar made of? Is it sucrose yes, or yeah, something I can else? tell you, um, certain palm trees, 
in Indonesia, they, uh, they have a flowering process. And the flowers are actually, you could say, milked, and the nectar is being uh, collected. And this nectar from the flowers contains a lot of sugar that, that can uh, be further processed into palm sugar. The thing is that palm sugar um, is not pure sugar. It contains also uh, a fraction of proteins, uh, other carbohydrates, even minerals, and even some vitamins. So it is a very, very impure product, but it tastes very nicely, very sweet, but it is surely not only containing sucrose, there are also many other kind of monodisaccharides and other components present. But as I mentioned, it is a major sweetening agent in Indonesia and also very important in Malaysia. So people are very much used in, uh, to use palm sugar in their day-to-day uh, -day preparations. They are very used to the taste, and that's why we developed this palm sap sugar for that typical market, the Indonesian market. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, our next You're question welcome. is: uh, the next question is, what is the best way to prevent sugar bloom? <laughs> um, to prevent sugar bloom, I will, I will give the floor to Claudia. I have talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. Um, the, the main thing you have to, to avoid is, uh, is, is water or uh, a high relative humidity, for instance. If you store the products in a tropical climate where you have a high relative humidity, the risk of uh, formation of sugar bloom is much, much higher. Because uh, the, due to the high relative humidity, you can have condensation of the surface of the chocolate and the water droplets um, will dissolve the sugar crystals in the chocolate and then afterwards they will start recrystallizing and that will lead to a uh, sugar bloom eventually. Um, another thing is um, avoiding too low temperatures. Um, for instance, storing chocolates in the fridge. Uh, many people do that because they, they say chocolate should not be stored at too high temperatures, but then they put the chocolates in the fridge and after a while they also get a, white, a whitish layer on the surface of the chocolates due to condensation on the surface again and recrystallization of the sugar crystals. So avoid high relative humidity and avoid too low temperatures. Okay, thank you. So mm -hmm. next question is, um, in West, this is a comment, not a question, but in West Africa, a type of wine is made from the sugary sap of oil palm tree and other palms. So it's a wine from that sugary sap after fermentation. So that was a comment uh, made by one of our participants. Yes, 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 yes. That, 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 that is true. Uh, they call it uh, palm wine. They call it palm wine. Um, and I have drunk it actually <laughs> a couple of times. So I can confirm I'm not a specialist uh, in that particular product. But it, is, uh, but it is being produced from a sugary sap, a kind of palm sap, from the old palm tree. Yes, exactly. They, the, the farmers make it themselves, and uh, that's why there is quite a lot of product variability. But I have tasted a few, and it's, uh, it's very nice to drink, yes. Our, um, and then last, another question came. Uh, besides cinnamon, what kind of other flavor or bioactive that we can incorporate into chocolate? Oh, that's an interesting one because um, you can always uh, try to innovate your products. Yeah. But in general, we can say that um, chocolate can be food paired with many, many other different kind of ingredients. And at first, I would think about many kind of fruits and dried fruits that contain also a lot of antioxidants. Um, quite often these dried fruits go very well, uh, for instance, uh, dried blueberries or whatever, with chocolate, especially also dark chocolate. So you can find a lot of products on the market where those dried fruits are combined. And this is also a way of combining the antioxidants, but I do not have any view on possible synergistic effect between those antioxidants and the cocoa antioxidants. We only did this investigation for cinnamon at the moment. Uh, another comment came uh, 
it's, it's talking about in Brazil, uh, they can find a few, I think, Belga, Belgium chocolate, probably it's meant uh, in specialized places or airport. Uh, and a lot of companies, they use uh, those kind of chocolate in their products as well. Mm -hmm. Most of them use this for transplant. Um, yes, so I think what we are talking about here is industrial chocolate that is available in Brazil um, that is being used to make other food products where it is incorporated. Um, I, I do not have a view on, on the market in Brazil uh, and the availability of Belgian chocolate. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a clear view on that. I'm, I'm sorry. But, but Belgian chocolate as an industrial product, business to business product, is being sold everywhere, uh, uh, all over the world, let's say. Hmm. Um, I don't see any other question, but I have uh, probably the last the last question uh, so you talked about antioxidant properties of uh, you know cocoa and uh, uh, ingredients polyphenols and then you also mentioned synergistic antioxidant properties was found when cinnamon was blended with cocoa yes. now uh, i want to know that you know how did they measure the antioxidant property was it an in vivo study or in vitro and no, it was uh, it was just in vitro tests. Okay, and and you see an increase in the property when you mix the two. Yes, yes. So we, I, I'm talking about conventional tests like the teak test uh, to to analyze the antioxidative power. We did not um, check this yet in cell lines or in vivo. Uh, no, it was just okay. um, uh, and the publication you can find it if you Google it. On those keywords, you will find it was just by uh, conventional uh, analytical tools. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, so far, I don't see any other questions. So, uh, if you don't have any other question, I think uh, we should uh, bring this uh, webinar to an end. Uh, and I thank uh, to Kuhn and Claudia for your time and such and entertaining informative presentation and thanks to AOCS for organizing this uh, webinar and thanks to all the participants for joining and bringing us all these interesting questions so thanks everyone thank you super team you did a great job i hope to see you again hopefully in st louis in a couple of uh, weeks or months yes yes thank you okay bye-bye thank you bye bye mm -hmm.